So we're going to go ahead and get into content for today, y'all. Uh, thanks for everybody for being punctual. We have pretty high attendance for today's uh, class meeting. Just, Zeb, just so you know, we I think enrollment for the class is around 22, 24 students. So this is, uh, this is pretty representative for one of our, our Thursday Zoom meetings. Uh, so uh, yeah, so in terms of our content for today, you know, a couple of days ago, we talked about the concept of protected areas uh, and we focused on that chapter within our textbook. And uh, to dovetail with that conversation, we have Zeb Weiss here with us today, y'all. And I hope, I hope everybody is able to, to get a, a, an amount of information out of this, this session that uh, you know, builds on what we talked about on Tuesday. It's kind of cool to actually have a director of a state agency on a call uh, to be able to share some of this information. And I don't really expect that y'all have much background in understanding how uh, protected areas actually come about in terms of their creation. And hopefully that's kind of the direction we can go with a bit of the conversation. So Zeb is, uh, is executive director the right term, Zeb? Yep, so he is the executive director for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. And if you all recall, we had Nora Salam visit us a couple weeks ago, and she's the uh, geospatial specialist slash nature serve uh, guru, her and another person in, the, in that shop. Uh, but Zeb's kind of the, the top portion of the pyramid here. So it's a big picture kind of view of how the agency functions. Uh, and Zeb has wore a lot of hats over the past few decades. He's worked in a variety of state agencies and maybe some different acronyms are gonna come up as we, uh, as we work through the material here today. I'll try to be pretty active with, with asking questions uh, of Zeb as we go along, but also if you all have questions, please either turn your mic on and, and chime in or feel free to, to type something into the chat box and I can interject that to, uh, to Zeb also too. You'll get the, get the feel here. Zeb's a pretty good talker. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a pretty active talker between the two of us. If we're not careful, we're just gonna be going back and forth, but please be as active as you can with this, okay? So uh, with that, Zeb, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And like we tried out here a few minutes ago, you should be able to uh, share slides and get into it. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my, my mic and you can just get into it. All right, thank you, Dr. Dodd. So um, before I get started, I'll say that uh, I have plenty of slides and I have way more than I'll get to. So I know that um, Dr. Dodd will or ask me some questions and keep me keep me rolling along. But if y'all again have any questions about what I'm going to talk about, please jump in. Um, if I say anything that conflicts with anything that Nor said a couple weeks ago, she is right because she is way smarter than me. But what I do is a little bit different than what Nor does. Um, I somehow I started off as a zoologist 30 years ago and somehow ended up uh, in real estate because my main job is the acquisition. Um, and conservation of natural areas, which you have to have obviously a background in conservation biology, and you have to have a background in the sciences, which is what I started off as, as a, as a habitat manager, really. But pretty quick, you'll learn that it gets into, um, you know, buying and selling and politics, and figuring out how to make things work. And um, it's, it's, it's a very different thing <laughs> than what probably most folks you talk to in the conservation world deal with on a daily basis. So I'm going to turn the screen. Yeah. Maybe uh, go ahead and I, I know you just mentioned the term zoologist, but like what are some of the other term, like what are some of the other positions that you've held across agencies? Because I mean, there's a lot of hats that you've worn and I think it'll oh, be wow. for the way that a, an agency career can kind of play out. <laughs> well, I'm a little, I'm a little bit different than most career paths, but so I started off uh, out of college as a, as a tech um, making, I think, five bucks an hour back then. That was minimum wage. Um, at Raven Run, I believe you're going to hear it from Raven Run next week. And so that's where I started with the county government. Then I went to state government. I worked for State Fish and Wildlife as an information officer. So I did a lot of presentations and public speaking type stuff. Went from there to Natural Bridge State Park as the naturalist and natural areas manager, where I got into actual on the ground, you know, habitat conservation, a lot of endangered species or invasive species work. 
From there, I went to nature preserves as a regional manager where I managed about 25 state nature preserves throughout eastern half of the state. And after that, I went to the Department for Natural Resources. I was their first biologist, and that's where my zoology really comes in. That's what my degree is in. I was their first biologist, and I was responsible for making sure all the land that they purchased, and we'll get into that a lot here in a minute, um, was managed according to their management plan with an emphasis on habitat management. Uh, and they purchased, at, when I started, it was about 77,000 acres that I was responsible for um, kind of uh, inspecting. I wasn't the primary land manager at that point. And then uh, in 2011, um, actually, I'll get to my first slide here, which Nor probably showed you. In 2011, the, the Nature Preserve Program, the Kentucky Wild Rivers Program, and the Heritage Land Conservation Fund program were three separate entities in three different agencies. They were the State Nature Preserves Commission, the Kentucky Division of Water, and the Kentucky Department for uh, Natural Resources. Um, they were parts of those agencies. Those programs were pulled out of those agencies and merged into the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. And I was the first uh, executive director starting in 2016. So I've been responsible for, for merging all those programs together and getting them to work together as opposed to being kind of parallel programs. And the reason they were parallel programs is all of them really involved with what we're talking about, buying land for uh, endangered species or habitat conservation purposes and managing it. Um, they were all very small agencies. Nature Preserves had about 15 people in it. Wild Rivers had one. Heritage Lands had two, and I was one of them. So... Those programs were merged, so that gets you, what, to 18 people, and we've since have grown the program to about 30 people, through mostly through grants um, and, and uh, competitive funding, things like that. But what we're going to talk about today, I know Nor might have showed you the slide because Nor's uh, primary responsibility is the little book here, providing a central clearinghouse. What we're going to talk a little bit about is number one, which is nature preserves and the bottom two, which are Wild Rivers Program and the Heritage Land Conservation Fund Program. Those all deal directly with land acquisition and land conservation. Um, I will talk just for a second. Actually, I'll, I've got another slide to talk about. It. So here's in a nutshell what we do. This is what we think Kentucky looked like around, say, 1750, around Daniel Boone era. This is what it looks like today. So as you can see, all the forests, uh, well, all the wetlands, particularly, and all the grasslands, the yellow and the, and the light tan color, they're gone. There's none left. Um, the forest, there's still quite a bit of forest, but obviously in 1750, these were the definition of old growth forest. There had been very little, you know, manipulation by native peoples, but nothing on the scale that we have done since then, where it's every, pretty much every stick's been cut on a 20 year rotation. And we only have two very small areas of old growth forests left in Kentucky from this picture. And they of course aren't pristine. Um, one of them is our Blanton Forest State Nature Preserve. The other one is EKU's Lily Cornette Woods, which we are also involved with. And I'll get to that here in a minute. Um, but you know, obviously everything's been turned into agricultural or, or urban areas or whatever. There's not many places left that are uh, what we would call intact kind of pre-settlement um, ecosystems. So our job is to try to find those as best we can and protect those as best we can. And we have a, a pretty big tool, uh, suite of tools to try to accomplish that. Um, so the first thing we do, we have a team of biologists. Like I said, we have maybe, I guess, maybe about a dozen on staff right now in our biological assessment branch. We are very botany heavy because we are the only agency in the state of Kentucky, state or federal really, whose primary focus is rare plants in Kentucky. So we have a biological, uh, we have a, uh, a plant conservation section with about five botanists in it. Their job is to figure out where the most endangered plants are in Kentucky, um, where they live, what kind of shape they're in. We catalog them, um, we put them in our database. We try to acquire those properties that have the best suite of species, the most intact um, uh, sample example of those species. Um, and also we try to guide development by other agencies and even private development into impacting them as little as possible. 
That's a tall order. There is an endangered plant list in state law, which we are responsible for, but it explicitly says that no species on that list can get in the way of private land ownership or development. So it's really uh, our list is the first cut in a sense of something becoming federally endangered. And when it comes to plants, even being federally endangered doesn't protect you that much. It's not the same as wildlife. That's very different. Um, but anyway, so we go out and look for stuff, what it boils down to. And we're the ones that, that work with professors and work with other biologists to determine what's rare. Then collect data in the field. This is where NOR comes in. Uh, collect data from a variety of other sources. Goes into our database. So we have the most comprehensive database of biodiversity in the state of Kentucky, and it's growing all the time. Um, we get data from not only, again, our own biologists and researchers, other sources. Um, we, we just entered into a partnership with State Fish and Wildlife. We get their data for wildlife. And we work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife as our main partner in everything that we do. So that all translates into dots on this map. We look at the dots on this map, and we try to figure out what is a priority for conservation. Um, you will notice that on the eastern half of the map, you'll see that big glob, that giant cluster there of multicolored dots that kind of goes from, uh, if you know your geography, it goes from about McCreary County up towards Moorhead. Uh, and that, of course, is the Daniel Boone National Forest. It's not surprising that a high cluster of rare and endangered species would still be found in our largest uh, you know, more or less wild area. Clearly a national forest is managed. It's not totally a wilderness area, but it's certainly a lot more wilderness than a cornfield or the middle of town. And you'll see the big cluster there. You'll see another cluster if you know your, your map very well. Uh, you'll another cluster at Land Between the Lakes in far western Kentucky. Right in the middle of the state, you will see uh, Mammoth Cave region, right around Mammoth Cave National Park in the Green River. You'll see a bunch up near Louisville. That's Bernheim Forest. And you'll see a surprising number around Frankfurt and down into Lexington along the Kentucky River Palisades. Um, and that's mostly because the Palisades on the river are real steep. And so there's a lot of vertical habitat. Uh, and there's some rare species that only occur there. So there's lots of green dots for rare plants. So we take all that info. Oh, and, and I also mentioned earlier that anyone can run this program that we have online to assess this information. This is where um, we try to get this information in front of developers. If somebody's going to build a road, the transportation department uses our data to try to avoid these places. Um, if you're putting in an airport, particularly air, air uh, fields have to look at our data. And the reason for that, for our perspective, of course, is we don't want them disturbed. We want people that know where this stuff is so they will avo can't avoid it. If you're a developer, if you can move a road or you can move something by 100 feet and get yourself out of the way, of potential lawsuits and potential uh, protests and all this, that, and the other, you're probably going to do it. You want to know where that stuff is too, because it's just going to be a headache if you end up taking out some in rare species or some kind of significant feature that you didn't even know was there. So we try to make this, we work a lot with these folks to try to try to get this information out there to them. And I'm sure Norm mentioned, we, we use software as part of the Nature Serve Network which every state has a natural heritage program. We're our state's natural heritage program. And in a lot of states, our program and fish and wildlife and state parks and state forestry would all be one agency. In many states, they're all one agency. Kentucky, of course, we're Kentucky, so we do things a little bit different. Um, we are a bunch of different agencies in a bunch of different cabinets, and we work together a lot. Um, but as you can imagine, there are times when we work together better than others. Right now, most of the folks I work with at these other agencies are folks that I've known for 20 years and I have good relationships with and we work together really well. There's times in the past where the agencies didn't work very well together. Who knows what happens in the future? Um, a lot of this stuff, uh, really, this is something you don't exactly learn in school, at least I didn't, is a tremendous amount of actually getting things done when it comes to conservation is personal relationships. You. you a tremendous amount of authority resides with just a handful of key people in these various government agencies or nonprofit agencies. And getting along with each other and working together is tremendously important. I'll just throw that out there because uh, 
it's it's something people don't think about a lot, um, but it, it's super, super important. Last thing I'm gonna mention regarding data is another thing we use this data for goes into, uh, we have an agreement uh, with NRCS, the Kentucky, I mean, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Our data, our database is used by all the Fish and Wildlife Department Farm Bill biologists. So if you are a farmer, and you call them and you wanna get money from the NRCS, federal money to do habitat management practices on your farm, they run our database and you would be offered extra money or specific money to do practices that benefit rare species or endangered species or significant habitats like grasslands or barrens or glades, which are declining if it's on your property. So we're working to try to help uh, private landowners um, also get a little bit of money to help manage for some of these rare species and, and rare and unusual ecosystems. Hey Zeb. So, yeah, you know, yes, much sir. of what I talked about on Tuesday was I, I tried to not use the term acquisition, but it kept sort of like seeping into my, <laughs> my speech, you know, yep. so I think a, a lot of, a lot of how I talked about, uh, protecting areas came about to like ownership within agencies. I mean, we talked about field stations too, and we talked about like tribal lands and a variety of different ways that lands could be owned for protection. But what you just talked about there was basically private ownership, but yes. uh, cooperation. So uh, maybe terms like easement and like what you're talking about there with those types of collaborative efforts, that would be that would be kind of new ground for us to get into. Okay. Well, that's just what I was about to get into. Um, so here's a great example. This is a map of every property that our programs are involved with. So before I talk about the programs, we are, we're in, the property we're involved with, let me talk about what we're not involved with. All the white you see on this map is either privately owned about 95% is private property on this map, or it is in some sort of public ownership that is not necessarily uh, what we would call conservation. Um, meaning, if you, if you look at government-owned property, a lot of times when they say government-owned property, people think about state parks, um, things like that. But government-owned property is also your county courthouse. And government-owned property is also uh, all the interstates and certainly not conservation areas, although I'll get to that in a second. Um, so 95% or so of Kentucky is privately owned. There is zero chance that we are going to buy or own or anything like that every place that we want. It, it's not going to happen. We don't have enough money to buy it. We don't have willing sellers and that's something else. When it comes to conservation, we do, we specifically in our statutes, we're all state agencies that I'm talking about right now, um, and we're all governed by law. I mean, we have Kentucky revised statutes, a state law. That tells me what I have the authority to do, period. I can do this, I can't do that as a state agency. There's also a separate set of rules called regulations. They tell me how I can implement those laws. So I have to walk, work within those boundaries. I can't just go out and do whatever I want to do. So it specifically says that none of our conservation programs have eminent domain. Eminent domain is where the government says, we're gonna put this highway through the middle of your house. Uh, if you don't like it, that's too bad. Here's your money, now get out of here. And eminent domain, you have no say in the matter. They, they determine that what they wanna do, what that entity wants to do is better for the whole Commonwealth. And so they're gonna do it. You, you have no recourse. Um, we, we don't do that. We can't do that. We wouldn't do it anyway, but we can't do that. We have to find a willing seller and we can only offer an appraised value. So we have to hire an appraiser, uh, a person that goes out and looks at your property and says, based on all the other properties and what they've sold for in your general area, here's what your property is worth per acre. So I offer you, I say, Dr. Dodd, I, you own the last uh, old growth in Madison County. I want to I wanna pay you $1,000 an acre. Uh, well, across the street, some guy sold a different lot for uh, $500,000 an acre because it's going to be a gas station. Dr. Dodd's going to tell me, well, I don't want a thousand an acre. You got to give me uh, 500,000 an acre. I'm going to say, I can't do that. Sorry. And so he's going to make it a gas station. Um, he doesn't have to sell to me. He doesn't have to do anything. It has to be a willing seller. 
So we can't buy everything we want. We don't have the money for it. We don't have the authority for it. It's just not going to happen. That is why this program with NRCS is new. We only started it about a year and a half ago. And it's it's the, one of the most significant things that we feel like we've gotten into. They run about 6,000 reports a year using our data. Um, so that's not 6,000 different landowners, but it's close to that. And so if we can get federal money put in their pockets to manage for the things that we can't buy in the first place, but are worth managing, that's a big win for us because we can't do everything. Um, so does this, does this mirror like maybe CRP or like some of the farm? Like yes, same stuff. Okay. Farm bills, farm bill. A farm bill program can be CRP. It can be, uh, uh, they've changed all the names on me. ASEP now is the, the big umbrella one. It used to be Equip, which doesn't exist anymore in WIP. So they've changed all the names, but it's any kind of farm bill program like that from the Farm Bill Act. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is you mentioned easements. So we're working on getting this map so it makes a little bit more sense. But basically what this map is, the red dots are nature preserves and natural areas that my agency, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, owns. It's state-owned property. We only buy the areas that really have federally listed species or really, really imperiled natural communities like old growth forest. There's only two in the state. That's the only stuff we really fool with. So we only have about 25,000 acres in those programs. Under state law, um, when we buy one of those pro properties, at the courthouse, you, you have a deed that says this is owned by the state. There's another piece of paper in the courthouse called articles of dedication. If we dedicate a state nature preserve, those articles spell out what we do on that property, what we can and can't do. Most important thing is a dedicated state nature preserve has the highest legal protection of in Kentucky state law. Um, it's higher protection than a state park or a wildlife management area. Once we enroll something as a state nature preserve, um, it's, a, it's about as good as it's going to get as far as not being sold or developed or extraction or any of that kind of stuff. It's expressly so, for the purpose of rare species. So as an example, like maybe like Lower Howard's Creek falls into that category, right? Lower Howard's Creek is a yellow dot. If you look okay. down there, what it is, which is a, it's a, it's a, that's a valid question. This is really convoluted. Believe me, I understand. <laughs> right. Hard to follow. I've been talking to Luke about this for 20 years and he still didn't get it because it is, you can't look for a lot of logic. A lot of it is kind of wheeling and dealing and, and protecting things with the best we can, the tools that we have at our disposal. So the red dots are what we own as state nature preserves. The green dots, we have a separate program called the Heritage Land Fund which are the nature's license plates you see up in the corner of this slide. We have a board of directors. Anybody, not just nature preserves, but any government entity or nonprofit, um, Fish and Wildlife Department, state parks, Division of Forestry, Raven Run, like local county governments, they apply for funding to buy land. If we have enough money and they meet our criteria, we buy the land. We bought about half of Raven Run. The part you, with the nature center and all that stuff, that's been part of Raven Run since the 80s. The other half of Raven Run, where a lot of the fields are and all along down the river, along Raven Run Creek and all along down the river, um, the Heritage Land bought about 15 years ago. We hold a conservation easement on that property. A conservation easement is a different piece of paper recorded at the courthouse that says same restrictions, but... Um, they can modify the easement by going through the Heritage Land Board. So a conservation easement means it has restrictions on it. They can't do whatever they do. We are partners with them. But if they want to do something different, different management style, they can come to the Heritage Board and ask for uh, basically authority to do something different. That's okay. where we get, where, yeah, that's where we deal mostly with parks, things okay. like nature centers, they're not as high quality as a state nature preserve, but they are worthy of conservation. Put it that and way. so, and so, when you say they, like in the case of Raven Run, so like Lexington, Fayette, Urban County government, if the if the county yes. city government says no, we don't want to be quite so restrictive with our activities, they can come back to you, and that easement can be modified, right? 
Yes, but it still has to be within the parameters of our statutes. It cannot be turned into a golf course. Right. It and so I just, I want to more outdoor recreation, but not, it still has to be hiking and stuff like that. And so relating to our textbook, y'all just think about, you know, we talked about like the first slide or two of what I started with on Tuesday was something along the lines of, you know, the types of, uh, protected areas are wide and varied and this is like really one of the most powerful right. ways to uh actually practice conservation because there's a lot of leeway and variation it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of kind of issue but it's kind of cool that you all basically can take other people's land and you know that's not owned by uh by the state outright and afford it the right. highest level of absolute like protection in perpetuity you can do that without having owned the land, right? That's the, the situation. And, you know, and, and that's where you get in with, so easements are not as strongly protected as articles of dedication, uh -huh. but that's the yellow dot. So you get into this yellow dot here, that's Lower Howard's Creek. It was funded by the Heritage Program, so we hold conservation easement over Lower Howard's Creek, but Clark County owns it of dedication on top of that so it is the highest protection okay um, even though so it's very convoluted um basically it's kind of a it's kind of a ladder though um and you think about green space to uh natural area or nature preserve basically you can have a pasture that you don't want to see turned into a gas station well that pasture is not as significant as Lily Cornette, but you still don't want it developed. You still want it protected. That's where a conservation easement comes in. You can restrict it from use. So it's all gonna be wide open. It's still gonna be a place where, uh, you know, the bunnies and the butterflies can fly around on, but it might not be the most significant example of an endangered species habitat in the state, but it's still worth something, especially to local people. It's still the place where they went and hiked around and it, you know, it still has a natural value, just not as much. It's kind of like the difference between, I would say, you know, winning uh, 50 bucks in the lottery and winning 50 billion bucks in the lottery. I don't know about y'all, but I'm not going to turn my nose up at 50 bucks. <laughs> right, like right. A free, a free 20, you know, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I might not hide it about 50 million, but um, so it's, it's, it varies. Now, the other thing that's in here that's way different is the Wild Rivers corridors. You'll see on here, you can barely see them, little blue, you know, segments of stream. We have nine Wild Rivers corridors in Kentucky. Those were designated by statute, by state law in the 1970s. Um, we're responsible for that program. That is essentially zoning. Um, the majority of those corridors, it only goes 200 feet on each side of the river on those corridors. Um, if you're a private landowner and you live on one of those blue lines, anything from the center of the river up 200 feet is zoned where you can't log, you can't do anything. Um, you still own it, but it's zoned. There's no easement. There's nothing recorded at the courthouse but it is zoned by the state, you can't disturb it in those corridors. Now, we do own in some corridors that are not privately owned. For instance, the Green River, Wild River, is entirely within Mammoth Cave National Park. So we don't have to go and inspect it every five seconds like we do one that has private landowners that may or may not understand what they can and cannot do. Um, we just talked to Mammoth Cave personnel and they're not gonna do anything. Uh, the same with uh, a lot of our forests are in, um, a lot of our wild rivers are in Daniel Boone National Forest, and we work a lot with the Forest Service, so that's that's fine. Um, but some of them are predominantly private property zoned, so we have to inspect them, we have to make sure when the land transfers, the new owner understands they're in a wild river corridor. It's, 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 it's really sort of like an easement, but sort of different. And again, a lot of what we do is that gradient, is that weird kind of a patchwork there's there is zero on none of these dots on here is a really a one size fits all conservation answer and not a one size fits all legal answer and that's kind of what i said earlier is uh you know what we do in this line of work is really weird there's only in state government there's uh um about thirty thousand state employees um there's only about a half dozen people that 
understand at all about anything I'm saying or how to do it <laughs> because it is just a very niche thing that you get into. Um, I do it for our cabinet. Um, there's a guy for Fish and Wildlife who does it because they do a lot of leases and a lot of conservation easements. Um, that's about it full time that does this. And then um, there are some people in the state finance cabinet and there's a real estate basic branch that we work on with the technical things like appraisals and surveys and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's, so, it's very so within KDFWR, what's, do you remember like what cabinet, like sort of what division that like this sort of purview falls under <laughs> we're talking about? Well, there, there's a couple of different, but um, basically there's one guy who works for in their commissioner's office who does land acquisition. Um, but there's also a stream mitigation program, the Philo program, who okay. does similar things. He works through them. I mean, they work through him. Um, so Philo does a lot of easements. We do a lot of this stuff. That's really about it. It's really us in Fish and Wildlife who do the bulk of it at the state level. Um, at the federal level, NRCS doing those private lands um, easements, the farm bill easements, they do most, they work with, they have positions at Fish and Wildlife and a position with us. So, but they do most of it conservation, I would say, from the farm bill aspect. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife buys a little bit of land at Clarks River National Wildlife Refuge. Forest Service doesn't really buy much land, had for a long time, just because they don't have a budget for acquisition. They could, but they, they don't have the budget for it. Same with national parks. So conservation land purchases just doesn't happen that much in Kentucky. There's not that many people doing it. We're pretty far behind our neighboring states on amount of land conserved, which is why, again, this private property stuff is so important. Um, I just wanted to point out again, all of our acquisition, most of it comes from the Heritage Land Conservation Fund. We always tout these license plates. When you buy a license plate, you're helping conserve and purchase land. But the reality is we get most of our funding from environmental fines levied by the state. So we get all the fines uh, levied against uh, polluters of air quality, water quality, or waste management issues. So if somebody has an illegal dump and gets fined, the money goes into this fund. If somebody is, you know, has a straight pipe and they're polluting a stream or river and get fined by the state, the money goes into this fund, it goes to land acquisition. Um, that's where really most of the money comes from. But the license plates do are significant. They do help quite a bit. Um, but you know, it's like everything else. We our revenue for land acquisition is uh, is going down every year, and land is getting more expensive every year. So, when I started in 2011 working on the land acquisition full time, um, we had about five to six million dollars a year for land acquisition, and now we have maybe one and a half to 2 million a year for land acquisition, but land has gone, is 10 times more expensive. It's absolutely gone through the roof. We would pay an average of probably $1,000 an acre back then. Now it's probably closer to 2,000 an acre. Um, and it varies greatly with part of the state, obviously. Um, we can stretch, we can buy a whole lot more land in Harlan County than we can buy in Jefferson County or Fayette County, clearly, obviously. So that's something that goes into the, that goes something that goes into conservation is deciding, you know, you have, you have, you have a finite amount of money. Um, do you buy, you know, maybe this area is a little bit better than this area over here, but what can you afford to do? Um, so real quick, I'm just going to run through what we have to consider when we can serve land for not just nature preserves, but also places like Raven Run. These are the things we have to operate under. We can only fund land that meets at least one of these criteria. Um, rare endangered species can also mean state listed. So that covers a lot of territory. Important to migratory birds, you can make an argument that just about any land is especially forested land, but also even decent prairie land is open to migratory birds. Um, natural functions subject to alteration or loss really means is the area in imminent danger of being a, a wetland to be that's gonna be drained or even a forest that's gonna be logged if we don't do something. So that's kind of the emergency clause. And then finally, outdoor recreation and education. But I will say that in our, in our laws, outdoor recreation is defined and public use is defined as in its natural state. 
So that's kind of vague, but we take that to mean hiking, bird watching, stuff like that. We don't do uh, anything else. We don't do four wheeling. We don't do just because you're outside doesn't mean it's in its natural state by the board's definition. And this is how we distribute our funding. About half of it goes to local governments. Again, this is where Raven Rudd would come in, um, colleges and land trusts, and then all the state agencies that regularly that own and manage conservation land each get a, a portion of it. Um, the reality is all of these agencies, every single one of these uh, work together at one project or another. So there's a lot of land that we own by ourselves and don't work with anybody on, but we own land um, half and half with state parks, half and half with Fish and Wildlife, um, half and half with uh, Western Kentucky University. You'll see EKU's logo on here. This is one of our in most interesting projects is when they purchased Lily Cornette um, in the early 70s, Lily Cornette Woods, due to the way Eastern uh, Kentucky's uh, land works, um, they bought the surface, so they owned the old growth, but they didn't own the mineral rights, which means legally at that time, if the mining company that owned the mineral rights wanted to come in and strip mine the old growth forest and blow it up, they could have in the 70s. Um, they could have done that. Now, going on into the 80s, that's called the broad form deed. Um, going on into the 80s, the law changed a little bit. So now they can't quite do that, um, but they still had ownership of the mineral rights, was not owned by EKU. So in the early, late 90s, um, the Heritage Land Fund bought the mineral rights for Eastern. So we have a conservation easement on Lily Cornette Woods but we have a conservation easement on the below ground that we that we help fund. So I guess if you know if Dr. Dodd wants to go out and do some research on the surface, that's none of our business. But if he wants to do some some coring, some drilling, and uh, look at some uh, earthworm diversity, then all of a sudden it's on our easement. That's the only time we've done that. That's a, again, that's an oddball situation. But that was an example of something that would only happen in Kentucky, where we would have to get out in front of potential mining of, of one of the only two old growth forests in the state. Um, and this is the kind of stuff we, we pay for that goes into buying a piece of property that most people don't think of. Uh, we have to do appraisal to figure out how much it's worth. We have to do a title. And what a title is, is we have to hire an attorney that goes to the courthouse and researches who really owns it. So, you know, you're on the deed today, you go back a little farther, your grandpa's on the, owned the property, he's on the deed. You go back a little farther, whoever your grandpa bought it from, he's on the deed. Now on a clean title, that's simple. It just goes, this guy bought it from this guy, bought it from this guy. It's real simple. Well, unfortunately it doesn't work that way half the time. Half the time, what it says is this guy bought this part, but then we're not sure who owned this part over here because the deeds don't match up quite right. And then a mining company came in and bought this little underneath ground part of it. And then this guy had a divorce and they didn't sign the papers right. So we're not sure if his ex-wife and their kid and her new husband has control of this part gets really convoluted. And so this is lawyer stuff. So if we don't find a nice clean title, we can't do it. And sometimes it is taken us up to a decade to clean a title before. And so we could purchase a piece of property. It really can be really complicated, especially in really rural areas where there's minerals and where there's, you know, other kind of a resource people own besides just the surface. And then a survey, of course, is just uh, figuring out where the boundary is, what you're actually buying. Uh, we do inventories to figure out what is on the site. Our biologists, and in some case, archaeologists, go out and make sure that we know what resources are there to protect, what we need to focus on, and what kind of habitat management needs to go into it. Sometimes we'll get a little bit of funding for that. And appropriate public access just means sometimes we'll put in a trailhead and parking and stuff like that. But we want to do it in a way that won't impede, you know, anything natural. We don't want to get in the way of any kind of natural process or anything. Um, so that's, that's, we spend a lot of time doing this kind of stuff, a tremendous amount of time uh, digging our way through. Um, I know earlier, uh, uh, Dr. Dot asked me about nonprofits and how we work with them. Um, so, we used to work with the Nature Conservancy a lot. We haven't worked with them in probably about 10 years because they've actually kind of changed their model and they really don't do what we do quite as much anymore. 
but we still work with, uh, with the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust extensively, particularly on the Pine Mountain region and like Letcher and Harlan and Bell County. And this is where they come in is a lot of times they can buy a piece of property for a little bit over the appraisal price. They can buy more than we can pay for because we're restricted by law what we can pay based on the appraisal. They might be able to pay a little bit more to get that property. Also, after they buy it, they have the time and the resources to clean up the title. So when I told you it gets all convoluted and we're not sure who owns what and who owns this, that, and the other, they can sort that out some, in some cases and buy the ex-wife's interest and then buy the subsurface mine from this guy. And they can figure that out in a way the state cannot um, after purchase. And so they wrap it up in a bow for us and then we buy it from them. And in many cases, they actually take a loss because they've invested a lot of time and money in straightening it all out. But, um, you know, they're a nonprofit. They're not in it <laughs> to make a, a fortune. They're in it to conserve the land. Um, in some cases, they keep the land and we're just partners. Um, there's a, a High Lewis State Nature Preserve is one like Lower Howard's Creek that is owned by Kentucky Natural Lands Trust, but a portion of it is dedicated. In other cases, like I said, they'll sell it to us. So it's, it's a, again, it's not a one size fits all. They're probably our major partner as far as nonprofits, although we work with Bernheim Forest a lot um, in Bullitt County, um, doing similar things, doing land acquisition and uh, conservation easements and a bunch of projects. I would in Floor Cliff, I'm not sure if you've taken Floor Cliff or talked about it. We work Floor Cliff a ton. Um, so there's several nonprofits that we work with regularly to basically streamline some of this. So, and so just real quick to follow up, there's a, so you mentioned Flora Cliff and I, uh, I'm willing to bet that at least there's multiple people in, in the class that have hiked around or been out of Flora Cliff. Like I take my Upland Wildlife Management class there, uh, which I don't think anybody in the current class has taken that, but it's, it's used for other teaching experiences. And of course, it's a place that you can go and just recreate at if you, if you've got the appointment and you've you're taking part in one of those classes. So like, that's just right up the road. That's, that's two people, right? Like it's, it's Beverly and Josie are the people on staff there. I know they hired right. <laughs> advertised uh, for just a few weeks ago on the wildlife listserv. Like there was an advertisement for a tech there, but they have their own board, right. That sort of guides what happens at Flora Cliff, but it's a nonprofit, right? It's an area owned. Right. Uh, how big, is, like in Bernheim, likely there's folks that have been out to Bernheim forest uh, you know, how big is Bernheim in terms of people and how big is KNLT in terms of staff? Just like these are oh, that products. kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. So, like you said, um, all these nonprofits that they vary greatly. Uh, KNLT is currently executive director and two full time uh managers, so field work, people that do the kind of stuff we're talking about in site inspections and habitat management, stuff like that. And then one, two, couple office managers and uh, like a development director, somebody else tries to get them grants. So I guess they have six people full-time at KNLT. And then they have a board of directors, which are all volunteer. They don't get paid anything. They're all volunteer. Um, Floor Cliff has the two employees, full-time and one tech, part-time tech, plus a board of directors. So Bernheim has a forest man, has the conservation manager, Andrew, and then he has three people under him. I think it's three. So there's four people that work on the 15,000 acres of forest, of, of natural area. But then they have the middle part with like a visitor center and a coffee shop and all this other stuff. And there's, you know, dozens of people that work there. Um, but I'm not, not counting them, you know, the more facilities management type folks. There's only, you know, four at Bernheim that I can think of. And then a board of directors, of course. Uh, TNC only has one, two, three, four, I guess, four field managers, you know, project managers out in the, out in the woods. Two of them are shared with Tennessee. And then they have a bunch of uh, office people that do various uh, admin type stuff. So yeah. none, of yeah, them are, I, none of them are super well staffed. Well, that and I guess that's what I'm trying to kind of hint at is that for any of these uh, nonprofits that we're talking about, they're smaller in terms of their total number of employees and the people that are part of the organization. But just a few weeks ago, we circulated the advertisement for that part-time tech position at Floracliff, and we've circulated 
materials for Bernheim before. Like there are opportunities to get in like kind of at the ground level, you know, boots on the ground type positions, even with these nonprofits, which is another type of job that uh, is worth keeping on your radar, right? And it's slightly different, but as I think Zeb's first few minutes of, of uh, the webinar kind of address, like it can be a long and windy path working in conservation in the state. <laughs> so like you yourself work for uh, the Kentucky Land Heritage, the, the Conservation Fund, right? Like that, and that's, that's a different entity. Like there's, there's lots of overlap here. So it all comes back to that kind of, as far as y'all that are interested in getting into conservation in general, not necessarily what I'm talking about, but just in the conservation field in, in Kentucky, the number one thing to do is get a part-time job, get a volunteer, get an entry-level job as a tech anywhere in the state and do a good job. So everybody that we have on our staff now, biologists, the professionals that we work with, every single one of them, we either brought up from the bottom because they started with us right out of school as a tech and, and we saw that they had they were exceptional. I can think of two or three right now. Um, and while the other people were, you know, they might had coworkers that worked with us for six months and they went on and did something else. We went out of our way to make sure they had a job until we could find something full time. I, there's at least three of them we did that for. The other ones, they all came to us because, I mean, we have at least a couple because they worked for uh, Dr. Dodd and he recommended them. And that, it was their job to lose because if he recommends them, we know they're going to be good. Um, I mentioned Bernheim Forest. Their conservation director, uh, Luke and I both went to grad school with him. I mean, we know him, know him. His recommendation means a lot. It means way more than a stranger. KNLT, the executive director of KNLT, I used to work with him at Nature Preserves. His recommendation means a lot. I mean, that's, you know, over at Fish and Wildlife, there is a ton of people at Fish and Wildlife that I either went to school with or used to work with. Um, our branch managers, who are just right below me in the, in the chain, they know everybody in the state. They've worked with people, gone to school with people, worked for different agencies. So getting in at the ground floor of any place in conservation, whether it's a state agency, a federal agency, a nonprofit, it's a small community and we all work together on a daily basis almost. So getting good, good recommendation from somebody local as, is, is tremendously important. We get people apply to our jobs all the time that on paper, um, education-wise, are probably a exactly the same you know went to eastern went to uk went to western did all the same you know classes same grades and everything else but if one of them was a tech at floor cliff and beverly james their manager says they were great and another person um worked at uh red lobster <laughs> uh, that's really not even a question i mean we're not even going to interview the red lobster we're going to hire whoever beverly says we should hire i mean it's tremendously important to do volunteer work and entry level work for, and I would go so far as to say for local folks, if you can, where you want to work, because they're, they're also interconnected. So these are all just pictures of some of the places that we've worked on. And several of them we have mentioned at different times where we hold easements on or otherwise protect. I'm going to run through them real quick. This is an example. This is, I haven't updated this recently, but this, is from last year, uh, an example of what we buy in a typical year. Um, we bought 2,000 acres in Bell County on Pine Mountain for state parks. We bought about 500 acres between Knobs and Bernheim um, in the Knobs region of Bullock County. And we got added to Green River, that's we own that. Green River is a hotbed for mussels, rare mussel species in the state of Kentucky. It's biodiversity wise, it's very important. Um, it's right next to Mammoth Cave. And then uh, Perryville Battlefield was, if you don't have never heard of Perryville, it's kind of interesting. It's the largest battle, Civil War battlefield in the state of Kentucky. One of the most significant Civil War battlefields in the Western Theater. So basically not Virginia. Um, it's really pretty important. It's down there in Bull County, um, outside of Danville and Harrisburg. And we're up to about 700 acres. We've almost completed the whole battlefield. And you might think, well, what does that have to do with conservation? Well, what we're doing is we're working with state parks and some, some nonprofits to manage it as pollinator habitat. We've gotten a lot of farm bill money. Um, we put our own money into it. We just burned it. We did a prescribed fire earlier this year, uh, just last month at Perryville. 
because the battlefield was a pasture when the battle took place. It should be open, but that doesn't mean it was fescue because obviously there wasn't any fescue. Kentucky 31 fescue had not been developed in, in 1862. So we spent, uh, it's a very important monarch butterfly uh, way station habitat. It's one of the biggest in the States for monarchs. So that's kind of example of how kind of multi-use can, can be a positive thing for conservation. That's a really big project for us. Are there other examples that like that, Zeb? Like uh, other other sites where there might be archaeological or sort of cultural? Oh yeah, there's sort of tons layers of layers on top of it. So Lower Howard's Creek, we've mentioned several times, is is uh, a contemporary. It was the industrial uh, area of Fort Boonesboro during the earliest parts of European settlement into Kentucky. So Lower Howard's Creek is super important historically. We have easements on um, Camp Nelson. Uh, which was an African-American recruiting station and um, in uh, outside of Nicholasville, which is open, uh, now it's part of the National Park Service. Um, Abraham Lincoln's boyhood home where Lincoln lived right before he moved to Indiana. We helped buy that. It's about uh, 300 acres of Knobs Forest in Hart County. There's bunches of them that are like that. There's, there's quite a few. Um, Blue Licks Battlefield is the only place in Kentucky and only one of two in the world with Short's Goldenrod, which is a federally listed species, one of the Kentucky's most rare species. It's all pretty much right on top of Blue Lick State Park, which was a, the last battle of the Revolutionary War is what they call it, where uh, the French and Indians fought um, Daniel Boone's uh, and his sons and, and relatives. Um, and that's right into Fleming and Nicholas and Robertson County where they come together. So there's lots of places like that, actually. Um, let's see. One and down here, I'm just gonna mention a few of the things that we do for actual conservation. Besides biologists that go out and look for places, and we have a whole team of land managers who manage them. And again, our primary focus is, uh, is kind of species and, and community related. So we wanna manage things to make sure if we have an endangered species population or a rare community that it, it improves or at least doesn't decline under our watch. So we do a lot of invasive species removal, we do a lot of prescribed fire. That's a big program that we've built up over just the last couple of years. Uh, we do a lot of the really basic stuff like um, putting up fences, keeping out four wheelers. We unfortunately have to work with law enforcement a lot because of trespass. This is the part that our managers spend a lot of time on that most people don't think about is this kind of stuff, you know, uh, meth labs in the parking lot, <laughs> that kind of stuff. We spend an unfortunate amount of time doing that, which happens anytime you have a rural area. Um, grasslands are extremely imperiled. Um, we ha used to have a couple million acres of native grasslands in Kentucky, and now we're down to literally hundreds of acres. I mean, not many of them are of any size or contiguous or co any kind of connectivity. So we do a lot of grassland management. I guess I had perhaps, perhaps prescribed fire on here twice. Um, again, botany is a main focus. So this is an example of just our rare plant species and how our botanists uh, try to target for a land acquisition and conservation, how we try to target rare plants. And again, I didn't mention this before, but you see a lot of this stuff in the Daniel Boone National Forest. And we work with them a lot on rare plant projects as well. Uh, they, they are actually one of our most significant partners, and you'll see there are a lot of rare plant locations in the Daniel Boone, um, including White Fringeless Orchid, which is federally listed. Um, we have one small area. We actually burned it this week on a prescribed fire. Um, we have one small population of it on a nature preserve, and then there's the other populations are all on the Daniel Boone, and we work with them extensively to try to manage those. Um, this is kind of interesting. You will notice there's a road on the right-hand side and a power line here in the middle. Um, we just entered into an agreement with the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet where two of our botanists, their entire job, it's funded by transportation, their entire job is driving or satellite imagery observation of roadsides like this one to look for rare species populations or grassland habitats specifically, which we have found quite a few. This only ended our first year. They did about 7,000 miles um, around E-Town uh, area um, looking for uh, these populations. And they found several of several different rare species. Uh, and we're working with KYTC to actually uh, develop a management plan for them, which would basically change the mowing regime, when they do it, what they spray, what they don't spray. Um, and all this is all geared really towards pollinators. That's why they want to do it, 
is because pollinators are becoming federally listed and they need to get out ahead of it. Um, so it doesn't become something onerous for them to deal with. It's way easier to protect what you already have to begin with and not mess it up uh, versus have to come in and do a bunch of mit mitigation and remediation and all that if something is federally listed. So this has been so a tremendous yeah. So Zeb, those two uh, botanists that you're talking about, are they in your shop or are they part of like, uh, yes. okay, uh, are they master's level uh, people or do they, are they coming in with a bachelor's? Vast majority of our staff is ma master's level. There is a, there are a, a handful that are bachelor's level. Uh -huh. Vast majority are of, of both our our manager, I mean, everybody I can think of, our, our biologists, our land managers, our data, our three main divisions, they pretty much all have master's degrees with very few exceptions, very few. So, I, yeah, definitely. And, you know, but not all of them do. I mean, sometimes you'll find somebody exceptional who doesn't. Um, we have a couple that are actively getting their master's now while they're working, which I did twice, and it's not even fun. I would not recommend that. I would definitely try to finish up before I went and worked. But um, anyway, yeah, master's is pretty much the standard. And I think that I could speak probably that way for most of the other conservation agencies we work with. And again, this gets into the, a little bit more into the roadside uh, project that we have. Um, we also are working a lot with iNaturalist now where citizens will turn in their observations of rare species on iNaturalist, the app, if you're familiar with that. And then if something looks really possible, really interesting, um, then our biologists will go out and vet it. We'll actually ground truth it. And we found several rare species, including this orchid, which hadn't been seen in 50 years in the state of Kentucky, just because somebody took a picture of it and put it on iNaturalist. And when it was ground truth, it turned out to be verified. So since we have a, you know, we have a, like I said, basically 30 people for 25 million acres, and we need all the help we can get. And uh, iNaturalist has been extremely valuable in getting uh, private citizens out there, hobbyists who know a lot, get out there and look for stuff. Um, we're doing more and more restoration where we will actually do seed banking. We will gather seeds on areas of rare species. We work with the uh, Missouri uh, Botanical Garden, Atlanta Botanical Garden, um, Cincinnati Zoo, um, have greenhouses. They do propagation for us of rare species on seeds that we collect, and then we'll put them back in nearby or adjacent natural areas. That way, we don't have to worry about genotype issues, and you know, we don't want to we don't want to plant something that's the right species, but it's from a population in you know Tennessee might be a little bit different, you know, that kind of deal. So we try to do as much local genotype for restoration as, I and mean, that's all we do for restoration purposes. That's super that's cool. cool. So, so that's yeah. real quick, Zeb. I would just point out. So, like last week, we talked about ex situ conservation, sort of like the importance of zoos and arboretums and and seed banks and those sort of like uh, you know off site efforts. So it's cool to see that like there's a state agency. I mean, definitely, WR does it too. Like that that you guys are in the game of uh, trying to provide those local genotypes to make the ex situ like strategies work better right that's really the only way we can get it done i mean we can't you know times against us between climate change and development pressures um we got to think got to think big um the last thing i just wanted to mention is the majority of these sites i've talked about are open to the public they have trailheads you can go hiking on them we encourage people to get out um, we get, we have we work with educational institutions schools scouts lots of groups to get people out on them um, have fo some folks who do nothing but trail management. If you get on our website, um, we have a basically a natural area finder where you can find and sort areas close to you. It tells you how to get there and what to expect when you do get there. And these are just some of our partners. Uh, again, Forest Service, U.S. Fish, uh, probably our two biggest partners, NRCS, Natural Lands Trust are also tremendous partners. We're working more with the American Battlefield Trust because there is a big overlap on history and, uh, and, con and uh, habitat conservation. You know, if an acre is conserved, uh, whether it's conserved because somebody uh, famous walked across it or because it has a rare species, um, it's, it's conserved. It's not a gas station. 
Um, and in some communities, and especially at the local level, they understand and are more interested in the history. That is a much easier way to get buy-in than talking about um, uh, rare plants and rare insects, is when you can talk about some local figure of importance to them. It's, it's a really easy way to get buy-in or an easier way to get buy-in. And then of course, again, all the state agencies work together. So that's it. Awesome. All right, gang, I just I typed into the, uh, the chat box that as we're wrapping up here, uh, feel free to, uh, to type a, a question there if it's uh, preferable to, to speaking up, but we've got about 15 minutes worth of class and I don't want to uh, waste, a, waste a minute because this is all good stuff. So I'm pretty much gonna keep us rolling right up until the end of class. Uh, and I would just open it up for, for questions. If anybody has anything related to the actual topic of protected areas, that's cool. But as we, you guys are getting the clear picture, I'm trying to use this as a vehicle to talk about jobs and professional development too. So questions about like uh, that, that avenue, ask away. I also wanna apologize for having to listen to me for an hour on eight o'clock in the morning. I remember those eight o'clock class days. It wasn't Zoom in my day. I had to drag myself out of bed and waller across campus for now. Anyway. So questions from anybody? Quiet, quiet. Uh, so so something here, Zeb, so you mentioned the, the Battlefield Trust group as a, like a sort of a non-traditional group that you're like increasingly working right. with. With a group like that, do they actually have uh, natural resource uh, stewardship people on staff themselves? Uh, you know, before you all started working with like Perryville State Park, did they have a naturalist on staff? That is a great question. Um, one thing you will learn as you get into this line of work, no matter what you do, is that nobody understands what you do for a living. So you do it all day long and everybody you work with understands what you're talking about and you'll spend 20 years trying to explain to your mom and dad what you do and they'll always get it wrong they'll think you're a, a forester or you work at a zoo or they just won't understand it because what we do in conservation is so foreign to what most people do for a living and they just don't really quite grasp it um, and that is certainly true with this battlefield trust and all the historic folks we work with is they care passionately about the site but you know most people even if they're historians, they're thinking about the people. So they don't know that that wasn't a fe fescue field when the battle took place. They don't understand that, that uh, it's, it, it didn't look like it. You know, they think when it's mowed and look like a golf course, that's what it's supposed to look like, you know, because most people's sense of history started uh, when they were a kid. They know what it looked like when they were a kid, and that must, must be always what it looked like. So it has definitely been a learning curve. And as a matter of fact, Perryville State Parks has been a tremendous partner because people talk to them first and they don't talk to me, which is good. And they cut off a lot of the questions, but they get a lot of, uh, especially initially, a lot of complaints. How come you're letting it grow up and look all weedy? And when I look out, it's, uh, it's coneflower and it's milkweed and it's uh, coreopsis and it's, it's native plants that are, um, that are pollinators are all over it and it's fantastic habitat. Other people see, man, that, that looks all messy. Why'd you do that? Why'd you let that happen? So they don't understand. It has been a tremendous learning curve. Yeah, I, I've, I'm thinking here too about like, <laughs> it's cool to have uh, the people that can talk about that stuff sort of be the front face or whatever of the, mm -hmm. of the group. Like I'm thinking also about, and some of the students may have heard me talk about uh, Maker's Mark and Star Hill Farms otherwise right. like in, in another class but like another example of how there might be sort of a stewardship angle that's with an organization that you don't normally think about like Maker's Mark Distillery and the large like Star Hill Farms is kind of the term for the larger acreage the, uh, uh, and ownership that, that Maker's Mark deals with but like they have uh, there's a guy who has a long history working with KDFWR and now he's the so-called uh, what environmental champion I think is the term that's for, his title yeah for he's that's the term for the biologist with maker's mark is right. environmental champion which is pretty which is pretty cool but uh yeah he's an EKU grad from from years ago 
but you know, he like that's a cool opportunity to be able to actually think about all the foot traffic for people that pre COVID were doing like a tour to Maker's Mark to go to the distillery. Uh, there's a lot of people that are coming there that aren't necessarily thinking about pollinators. And guess what? They get to hike on a trail that uh, Jason Nally and and his people have put put on the ground, and all of a sudden they they get to learn about it a bit more. So it's cool that like the interactions with like Perryville at the battle, the like battlefield sites and those kinds of things that it, it provides extra avenues to talk about the, you know, the stewardship that's going on. It's funny. You mentioned now it goes back to uh, our previous kind of discussion. He, I, I've known him for 20 years. We worked at fish and wildlife as well. And we've traded uh, technicians in recent years um, as well. Uh, we, we worked together a little bit, um, quite a few of the, of the, of the, companies have uh, some level of environmental champion, whether it's sustainability or whatever, more and more getting into pollinators because that's kind of a buzz thing right now. People like butterflies. People understand that they're not doing well and it, they're relatively easy to plant a butterfly garden. So, I mean, I know Toyota's getting into it. Um, there, there's a bunch of uh, the distilleries that have something similar. Um, Makers is probably the most well-developed, but it does exist right. in several places. And I guess that's the, there's a linkage there too, at least sort of like in the deeper history of like Bernheim Forest and like the ownership associated with like, uh, with, oh, uh, with like Jim Beam and like the Lart, like the, like those kinds of, there's overlap right there, like right. here in, in Kentucky with the distillery scene. There's a lot of land that's buttoned up against these types of places. So, okay. Well, and then the, the gimmick too is with the distillery specifically is, uh, you know, what makes bourbon bourbon in part is uh, the water and from a karst area. And right. so you have to pay, pay a certain amount of attention to uh, clean water supply and healthy forests that go into that and that type of thing. That's a certain amount of, of uh, attention. Yeah. And whenever I've talked, whenever I was first starting to get to talk with, with Jason Nally, like he started talking to me about how Maker's Mark actually has like a 50 year plan uh, for the ownership there at the distillery. It's pretty cool to think about, uh, having ownerships here in the state where people aren't just thinking about five or 10 years down the road, but they're thinking like decades out, 50 and 100 year sort of visions for what something right. would look like. And that's, you know, that's the kind of thing you might assume goes with a, a state or a federal ownership, but uh, it's cool to see it actually like in private. So Derek is asking here, he says, what's the model that TNC uses now and why has it made the partnership with the land trust stronger over the past decade? Uh, I'm asking because because they're both nonprofits. Right. So I would say Kentucky Natural Lands Trust has a more kind of what we would call traditional model where they're looking at uh, buying a specific acreage, a specific piece of property and managing it or, or rolling it over to an entity that will manage that acre in perpetuity for a long time. Um, TNC has kind of gone more into the, the carbon market business in that they don't really buy land and manage it as much as they enroll uh, private landowners and organizations into their, their working woodlands program, which is more of a, of a carbon market uh, issue. Um, so they mostly work now and mostly in eastern Kentucky and southeastern Kentucky. Um, a lot of it's kind of sustainable forestry. Uh, easements, they still hold easements on, on property more so than they now, more so than they actually own property. So it's less of a land acquisition model than it is more of a kind of a conservation easement model. So it's just, it's, it's not, uh, it's not night and day different. It just doesn't quite line up with the, the acquisition model that we follow. Cool. And that, I would just remind everybody that kind of <laughs> dovetails with the, the assignment for this week, that reforestation <laughs> hub. Uh, page that you're working off of for the one pager that's due tomorrow tomorrow night. Uh, you know, the idea there is that it allows you to sort of look across states and across counties within a state at kind of uh, the overall benefits uh, within any given area. So that's the kind of thing that TNC would be scrutinizing, you know, to try to maximize their abilities to sort of, you know, do good in the carbon market. And I don't want to speak for TNC too much, but I'll say that I've seen them give enough presentations on this that I, I think I can say this, is they have looked at their national models. They have national climate models, and they've identified certain areas as being the most resilient to climate change. 
So they're putting all their eggs in that basket. They're saying this part of southeastern Kentucky seems to be the one that's going to survive climate change or deal with climate change the best over the next hundred years. So that's where we're going to work. Whereas our model says uh, Kentucky Gladecrest only lives in Jefferson and Bullock County. And if we don't do something to protect it where it is right this very second, we know it will go extinct. It's the only place in the world that it lives. So we cannot drop it and just all focus ever in this one area. So I feel like, you know, that's the other thing we talked yeah. earlier is there's uh, there's places for both. I mean, we, there's no point in everybody doing the exact same thing. There's a lot of needs out there. So they're just doing a slightly different model than we are. Cool. Uh, other questions? All right. Okay. Well, I am taking us right up to the wire, but that's all right. I told, I've, I've said this multiple times. Like it's not, it's not every day that we get to have like a, you know, the, the head of a, an agency sort of on uh, in the classroom or on a call like this. So I wanted to, to maximize the time uh, that we were using. Zeb. thanks. Thanks for doing this. Uh, Ain't no problem. Otherwise, I know you guys are really uh, putting effort into keeping active on the on the social medias, and I, <laughs> I I think it's funny like a school like EKU or any number of other places uh, tries to promote their Twitter, their 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 Facebook feeds. I don't know how effective that actually is in the big scheme of things, but for uh, for y'all for the students that are that are here. Uh, if you did follow KMP on uh, Facebook, there's a lot of information there. Like you can kind of see a day in the life with a lot of their stuff. There's there's uh, sort of active pictures of them doing burning more recently, but they showcase a lot of different ownerships, uh, a lot of different people. And it's just a, that would be a good way to passively pick up a bit of uh, what the agency is is getting into. So while I normally wouldn't be promoting like social media, I think KMP actually does. It's, it's a useful, it's a useful tool, especially for students that might be looking for, you know, gainful employment. So, uh, all right. Thanks, Zeb. I really appreciate it. Uh, and with everybody else in class on Tuesday in person, be ready to get into the next chapter. That's it. I'll talk to you later.